are listening to the True Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. All right, welcome everybody, and I'm so glad to be with all of you, and uh, thank you, Kathy, for joining me again this evening. It's been a quite a challenging week uh, from my computer getting attacked and everything getting corrupted and um you know and then oh, it, it's just been trying but anyways i'm glad to be here with all of you there's lots to talk about of course many of you know um that i released my newest book my 10th um and latest the firmament the vaulted dome of the earth just a couple weeks ago and i did receive shipment of them um just yesterday and so those of you that have some payment that are interested in purchasing them i will be shipping them out in beginning monday and i'm very excited for all of you to finally be able to have uh, the material in your hand and in book form and to be able to study it and read it in the way that i have for uh, the past year and I feel really good about all of the information and um, I've done two shows now um, with uh, brother Rob Skiba who also has a show here on Truth Frequency Radio um, called Revolution Radio he comes on broadcast Wednesday evenings which is 12 midnight my time uh, to 2 a.m. and so in doing those um those shows that I did with them, it was really late night for me. But that'd um, be morning. That'd be yeah, right, early morning. <laughs> right, early morning. <laughs> and but um, I, you know, I, I love sharing time and fellowship with Rob. I have great respect for him as a researcher, um, and for standing with truth when so many others are afraid to, uh, just because a topic may be controversial a lot you find that a lot of people will avoid it and just um are unwilling to investigate it and so um and, and you know i think that's one of the reasons why truth remains hidden in the way that it is because just because of the controversial nature of certain things even like with 911 you know um so many people didn't want to look into it investigate it because they didn't want their uh, their bubble, their you know comfort zone, um, impinged upon, or they didn't want their whole uh, perspective as far as their faith in government and um, you know their the authorities that they look up to to watch out for them and take care of them and keep them safe. Um, they didn't want to know the truth of oh my goodness can some aspect of government really be sinister and um and, and devious in the way that coming to and embracing that inside uh that 911 that aspects of it were most certainly an inside job and that government's agencies or shadow government or some aspects of them had to have contributed allowed and you know, perpetuated allowed to go forth uh, the success of those attacks and there was ulterior motive for all of that as well but you know this show is not about all that but um i'm glad to be here with you kathy how are you doing sister yay oh i'm doing great thank you i just finished your book it's fantastic i can't say enough about it you know you've put together um, for us in one place an analysis a, a compilation of so many texts and scripture, and commentary, things that uh, we wouldn't have known to go look for. And, you know, it's amazing to see it all come together, the way you've outlined your chapters, the breadth of uh, what you've brought to light and discussed in, in the book is just stunning. And I can't recommend it more highly. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to you receiving a final copy as well because um, you you do have the rough draft and I've added even so much more. Oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah. The, I think that one that I sent you was only like 
440 pages, and this one is 456, so there's quite a bit of additional information. And it's laid out, you know, in finalized form. It's um, it, There's no, you know, just grammatical and syntax errors or anything like that um and your your graphic artist who did that cover that is a beautiful cover yeah i want to give a shout out to my friend jared allen for his willingness to work with me on these things uh it's a it's a it's incredible how far we've come in journey because he also did my cover for skyfall which you know shows yeshua uh, holding the world as a, a globe, and so in three. Oh well, it, the the firmament <laughs> one I've got to say puts NASA to shame. <laughs> well, yeah, anybody that really does any research into that, I mean, using their own words and their own studies, um, you know, they shoot themselves in their in their own oh. foots as far as uh, the deceit and the hoax and the deception that is associated and tied with uh their efforts and their supposed accomplishments, which we know to be false and fabricated. Um, and so anybody that does an investigation and looks into that, which is why, you know, I opened the whole book with um, investigating a little bit into that so as to set the premise for why it is that I am revisiting the Genesis narrative and looking again at the... Um, the the whole timeline for creation the creation week so as to glean further information and to reassess all of those teachings in new light and with new discovery because now i no longer believe uh the things that nasa says as far as and also what science affirms as heliocentricity especially now that i know that you know the earth is in no way moving yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and when you think about it too, um, all the weather's manipulated. So that was one area I was going to give to NASA that, okay, maybe the information we get from them for that's okay, but the weather's manipulated. You know, anybody can look up the, I think it's the Army document um, controlling the weather by 2025. Right. You know, mm-hmm. so it, it, I used to try and give them the benefit of the doubt. Or try and verify, you know, validate something that that they'd put out, like the rocket landings, or and Crow Triple Seven just put out an eyewitness testimony and and a video of um, the uh, was it last night, uh, the nineteenth, yeah, yesterday rocket launch that it shows clearly that it's going straight. It's not going, you know, up into the atmosphere. So, you know, there's not, I'm just, I'm done trying to validate NASA. Right, right. Or, you know, believing them in any way. And it seems even laughable now, the kind of things that we used to give them the benefit of the doubt upon, you know, like with the Apollo missions and they're having landed upon the moon when they affirm, uh, even with the Orion missions, the trial by fire, the video presentation that they put out speaking about their attempts to to send manned missions to Mars and how they can't, even in this day and age, get beyond the Van Allen radiation belts because of the the dangers, the extreme levels of radiation, which would not only harm the um, astronauts, but also the computer systems and the other, uh, you know, the aspects of all the telemetry and the uh, the computer guidance systems and everything, you know, with everything being a computer based now, um, they have not yet even been able to achieve um, fixing up a, a lunar module which would be able to sustain entry and exit um, past these supposed you know, the the Van Allen radiation belts and supposedly they had already done so back in the 60s. And so they affirmed inter- themselves. It was interesting. There's been a, a fairly recent article uh, that uh, NASA or some study said that um, the Apollo astronauts, we, it was a wider range, but that they had a greater incidence of cancer. 
And I think that they're doing that in response. Yes. To the <laughs> right. I, yeah. You see a lot of stuff coming out that's obviously a response. I mean, they never would have addressed that before. The other thing I wanted to point out, it our cell phones that we have now have more tech, have uh, more powerful technology than they use to um, handle the the moon landings, right. moon launch, the whole Apollo, you know, launches. That's more power. You've got to grasp that. That's the absurdity of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to say. I can't remember. It'll come to me. It'll come to you. Yeah. Um, but uh, but also before we go into the book and begin to talk about that, um, I wanted to bring up because there's a lot of interest in a video that you had shared with me um, a couple weeks back, and because of all the things that I've been dealing with and all the complications and computer issues, I, I did not have a chance to really even. Uh, to watch it, and many of you are also speaking about uh, those of you that are interested in flat Earth as topic and have been looking into it, investigating it. Uh, and that particular video is uh, "There Are No Forests on Flat Earth." Uh, wake up, which is an interesting title and one that I didn't understand until I began to look at the uh, the content, and uh, it's interesting, but. Let me get you to talk about it, Kathy, just for those that don't know what it is or what it's about, uh, can you explain a little bit about the um, the material? Well, um, there's a, a Russian um, videographer, a video YouTube channel, and he put a video out of maybe a month ago now. It's called No Forests on the Flat Earth and takes you through... Um, petrified wood, uh, you know, some some inf various information, and then kind of a reveal shows the Devil's Tower and these hexagon hexagonal <laughs> hexagonal <All right. laughs> shapes that you I didn't realize before that they curved down. It it resembled more of a um, a tree a tree stump. And he just takes you like, and there's humor. And, I mean, he did a really good job. I really like it. You know, who cut it? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, you're kind of brought into that with the Devil's Tower. And then he takes you and shows, I mean, a lot of people ridicule it. But I, I thought it was a, a great um, way presentation. to presentation yeah. to see various uh, shapes of tree stumps in comparison to these buttes and um, uh, tabletops, pla uh, plateaus. And they were uh, exactly the same, I mean, but the vastness of, of these buttes and plateaus. And come to find out, a lot of, uh, well, Devil's Tower and, and many of these, they have no volcanic activity, which is what we've been told <laughs> that is the create is the thing that created yeah these. the forces that brought it into being exactly and so here's another lie <laughs> um what is going on and some of the uh, so-called science falsely so-called <laughs> there's a couple of videos going around uh, this man is uh showing the hexagonal shapes that are just you know perfectly formed and also, uh, in another part of the video, he, he shows, you know, uh, living organisms. And I know one thing that popped into my mind was um, a, a, a photo image that was taken a few years back of, of, the, of a molecule. And it has the same shape, the hexagonal shape. And so there's a living component to this. And so you wonder about this equation of it being a, tr a tree stump, you know, a, a gigantic tree stump. Right. So that was, and then um, he also went into, I'm, I'm not sure so much, because I really haven't gone into this much since mm -hmm. prior to another rabbit hole, um, but he showed uh, huge canyons, I mean, Grand Canyon, and other um, um, uh, natural, well, natural um, valleys and, and just all these different areas around the world that look like quarries. And so there was other things to wrap your brain around. There was yeah. a lot. 
Yeah, and as far as the the video and you know the postulations that are put forth by this individual, I mean, it's just another one of those things that makes you go, hmm. You know, it's not that we are saying it is this way or that way, um, be- because certainly there needs to be much further research and investigation into this and people that are biologists and that understand uh, the differentiation, the distinctions between living organisms and uh, the structure, like the hexagonal shape that uh, these living organisms and their cells, it's a component that shows or seems to affirm that these things that we see and we always thought to be mountains might could have possibly been at some point in the very ancient past. Exactly. Trees, which well, is the, fascinating. The, the thing that always um, really bothers me now is they have have told us differently. And they stand by that when, when you actually examine it. It's so obviously untrue. And then you wonder, well, why why have they been telling us that? And and it's like the flat Earth and space and and all of that. So you have to look at it with new eyes, right? And and you know, again, just like the whole thing of when you first learn that um, the Earth is not moving, that all of these different heliocentrists that did these experiments to determine the rate and the velocity of the axial motion of the Earth and its uh, movement in, as it orbits around the sun when they de- failed to detect any motion and any velocity, any rate of speed. Well, no matter what shape you think the Earth is in, whether it's sphere or diamond um, or round or yeah. convex, stuff, it, it's not moving. And so that forces you to reassess, well, if the Earth is not moving and it's not spinning once every 24 hours and it's not um, orbiting around the sun, well, what does that mean as far as the system that we live in? You know, as far as the supposed solar and planetary system, all of that is negated and has to be thrown out the window. And and so it forces you to reassess where we are and who we are. Um, in connection with uh, both the creator and creation. And so uh, those are things that we are, you know, and this is just another one of those things thrown on top of all of that, which forces you to, you know, reassess the whole thing with as far as these mountains, which is interesting right. because um, th- there's some texts out there, and we'll go into this when we come back from the first break. But I was just recently reading a a text called The Gospel of Bartholomew, and there was a couple passages in there that seemed to apply to this particular topic. And um, it's fascinating, the connections, because uh, even in, again, for those that, um, you know, as far as the Quran and the material, as far as the uh, the the Quran and the, those passages that are there in contained, uh, not saying that they are inspired in any way, but it's interesting to me that also the there's several passages which speak about the size of Adam as being sixty cubits, and uh, the Gospel of Bartholomew also seems to affirm that both Adam and Eve were of very much size and 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 even gives a measurement, and so. Um, which I have always taught in all of my books that it's my belief that the pre, uh, flee, pre-flood humans from Adam to Noah, the first 10 or f- first 10 generations, uh, prior to the flood of Noah's day, that because they lived almost a thousand years, Adam being 930 years when he succumbed to death, and I think the longest lifespan it was attributed to Methuselah, and he lived 970 years, that um, the these longer lifespans, in my opinion, affirmed that they were different in, as far as their stature, their size, 
and that that is what contributed to their longevity. Um, and I have always affirmed that. I have even stated in many of my books that the pre-flood humans from Adam to Noah, that they would be considered what we reference as giants uh, today uh, and just being regular human, but we would consider them of giant size and that the giants, the real giants that were born, the six-fingered, six-toed, double sets of teeth giants, those that were born from the fornication of the watchers with the daughters of Cain, that they were even of very much larger and greater stature than um, the you know pre-flood humans that lived almost a thousand years, and they had seemingly almost immortal lifespans, even though they did succumb to death. It was after very very long time, uh, and that the Sumerian kings list and um, these different lists which show the reigns, the supposed reigns um, of these different individuals uh, that they live, you know, up to 36,000 years, um, that some of their reigns are 36,000, 24,000, 28,000, uh, very long times that they were sitting up on the thrones. Um, and it, it's my opinion that these these particular reigns and these lengths are connected to the the rebel angels when they um you know when they first came down and that they were ruling over the pre Adamite people, which um also just to let everybody know, I, I just did a show last night with David Carrico where we talked about the Antediluvian Age and it's uh remarkable that he and I have come to similar discernment on that as topic. And um, what is so in interesting and fascinating about it is I come to discernment on this by studying all the mythologies of the world and all the extra biblical texts. And David, um, you know, basically just sticks to the, the canon and uh, the authorized uh, biblical texts. And he was also but still, you know, brought to similar discernment. And so um, that show will be released by Kay and Chad over there at Detection um, Deception Radio, uh, Deception Detection Radio, um, this Sunday. And so definitely take, uh, give a, you know, listen out for that. It will be a most fascinating show. And I don't think we're going to get a break here, Kathy, because <laughs> um, there doesn't seem to be any bumper music, which is fine as long as everybody can you know, still hear us and there's no problems with anything. Um, I'll just go ahead and go into some of that material, and then we'll just keep rolling. And then after I talk with this... Um, it, Okay, you know, brother. One thing, Go ahead, one Kathy. thing about the uh, no force on flat Earth, it really speaks to a lot of people. It, I mean, it really touched them deeply. That was uh, something I saw recurring, and you know, a lot of us were uploading it on our own channels. And you know, this is important. See this, and you know, a lot of activity going on in Facebook groups, new Facebook groups. So it was very unique in that way. Yeah, and, I'll, and, you know, again, it's one of those things which forces people to re-examine. Yeah, yeah. Re well, and re you know how a lot of movies uh, foreshadow things or, you know, hidden in plain sight. There's a lot going on in the movies we watch. For well, that's also true with the, the whole no force thing or, you know, big trees. Um, um, Avatar was one that I watched right. again, and there was a lot going on there. Um, there's a movie called The Fountain, and, you know, there's there's more. So that's something going on here as well. Yeah, and I didn't get a chance to see that yet, but um, I do want to go ahead and share this, this story. Um, it's from the Gospel of Bartholomew, and it's really interesting because it speaks about um, – the, the resurrection when Yeshua went the three days that he was 
uh, away from his body and the story is that he went down into hell and pulled Adam and the rest of the patriarchs out from their bondage in Abraham's bosom. Um, and this story, it, it mentions Adam's stature. And then I'll go into that other passage, which specifically talks about his size. And if you consider the sizes that are, you know, attributed here in scripture and, and basically parallel those with what is being talked about in this uh, particular video. It is fascinating indeed. And then, you know, again, I said that the giants have a very much larger stature uh, in the book of Enoch. It speaks about that as being 300 L's and Kathy's got the breakdown of all that. But um, we'll talk about that when we come back from uh, the break, which is offset, just so you know, Kathy, because okay. of the the way things got, um, you know, in the beginning, they were, uh, it was jacked up just a little bit. But anyways, reading this, it says, Hades said, Who is the king of glory that cometh down from heaven unto us? And when I had descended 500 steps, Hades was troubled, saying, I hear the breathing of the Most High, and I cannot endure it. Um, but the devil answered and said, Submit not thyself, O Hades, but be strong, for God himself had not descended upon the earth. But when I had descended yet 500 steps, the angels and the powers cried out, Take hold, remove the doors, for behold, the king of glory cometh down. And Hades said, O oh, woe unto me, for I hear the breath of God. And Beliar said unto Hades, Look carefully who it is that for it is Elias or Enoch or one of the prophets that this man seemeth me to be. But Hades answered, No, death, and said, No, not yet are six thousand years accomplished, and whence are these, O Beliar? For the sum of the number is in my hands. And the devil said unto Hades, Why affrightest thou me, Hades? It is a prophet, and he hath made himself like unto God. And this prophet will we take and bring him hither unto those that think to ascend to into heaven. And Hades said, Which of the prophets is it? Show me. Is it Enoch the scribe of righteousness? But God hath not suffered him to come down upon the earth before the end of these six thousand years. Be not troubled. Make safe thy gates and strengthen thy bars. Consider God cometh not down upon the earth. And then Hades said unto him, these be no good words that I hear from thee. My belly is rent, and my inward parts are pained. It cannot be but that God cometh hither. Alas, whither shall I flee before the face of the power of the great king? Suffer me to into myself, for before thee was I formed. Then did I enter in and scourged him. This is Yeshua speaking and bound him with chains that cannot be loose, and brought forth thence all the patriarchs, and came again unto the cross. Bartholomew saith unto him, I saw thee again hanging upon the cross, and all the dead arising and worshipping thee, and going up again into their sepulchres. Tell me, Lord, who was he whom the angels bear up in their hands, even that man that was of very great stature? And what spakest thou unto him that he sighed so sore? Jesus answered and said unto him, It was Adam the first form, for whose sake I came down from heaven upon earth, and I said unto him, I was hung up upon the cross for thee and for thy children's sake. And he, when he heard it, groaned and said, So was thy good pleasure, O Lord. And so here, you know, he pulled up Adam, it, this is the first resurrection spoken of in uh, the Gospel of uh, Nicodemus as well. But um, again, he, you know, Bartholomew sees that Adam is very different uh, than the rest of humanity. And he says that this man who was of very great stature, and then Yeshua tells him this is Adam, the first form. And then uh, another passage, which is, again, so very interesting when you consider all this. Um, let me pull up exactly this particular where it says the exact size. Oh, here it is. Okay. It says this. 
then follow a series of hymns and sung in heaven eight in all which accompany thy reception of Adam and the other holy souls into glory. Adam was 80 cubits high and Eve 50. And so, um, Kathy, didn't you say you did the breakdown for? Yeah, that would, um, Adam would be 120 feet and Eve would be 75 feet. And so if you consider if Adam and Eve were of such size, then consider, you know, those mountains um, being what they are. And if they were actual trees, I mean, it, it certainly seems that it could fit, you know, with, uh, well, not only humans, but um, there's a mention of Satan or Beliar being. And just, how tall, he was much taller. Yeah. It was in the same text, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. Let me um, find that particular passage. But actually, before I get to that, let me read uh, just a couple things from the Quran that also speak about Adam, which is interesting as well. Uh, Allah, the exalted and glorious, created Adam in his own image with his length of 60 cubits. And as he created him, he told him to greet that group, and that was a party of angels sitting there and listen to the response they give him, for it would form his greeting and that of his offspring. He then went away and said, Peace be unto you. They, the angels, said, May there be peace unto you and the mercy of Allah. And they made an addition of mercy of Allah. So he who would get into paradise would get in the form of Adam, his length being 60 cubits. And then the people who followed him continued to diminish in size up unto this day. And remember, after the flood of Noah's day, it says that the lifespan of humanity would be reduced to 120 years, which is exactly what happened. After Noah, who lived, um, I believe his lifespan was in excess of 400 years, and his children also lived uh, 400 years. And um, after Noah, they, you know, basically were reduced. Abraham, I think, was 175 years, and then steadily after him to 120 years to now, um, you know, a generation is 70 to 80 years, according to Psalms 90. And so there are four other passages. Now, I'll just read um, really quick. Allah created Adam, making him 60 cubits tall um, in it says also people have been decreasing in stature since Adam's creation. This is from the Saha Bukhari, Volume 4, Book 55, uh, number 543. Um, uh, another passage, they, their wives will be Horus, Horis, H-O-U-R-I-S, whatever that is. All of them will look alike and will resemble their father Adam in stature. 60 cubits tall. There's four different passages which uh, speak about this. Um, and so you can find that also, you know, just type up. And there's even uh, some commentary on the Quran which speaks of Adam as being 90 feet tall. And so I don't know whether, you know, 60 cubits, if that is actually 90 feet, but the passage about Beliar, which is, you know, one it of says, the... I found that. Go ahead. It says uh, he was 1,600 cubits, right. which is 2,400 feet. Wow. And uh, uh -huh. So what's that? Like a half a mile, right? Uh, yeah, maybe that's the one where I got a half a mile. Yeah, because like, isn't a mile like 5,280 feet? Oh, yeah, the... yeah. That's the one where I got. Yep. Yeah. Like four or five. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let me, I'll read this passage again. This is also from the Gospel of Bartholomew. And it says, And Michael sounded, and the earth shook, and Beliar came up, being held by 660 angels and bound with fiery chains. And the length of him was 1,600 cubits, and his breadth, 40 cubits. Um, there's a Latin version as well. It says uh, in the Latin, 
His length is 1,900 cubits. His breadth, 700. One wing of him is what 80 is cubits long. What is one wing of him? <laughs> you know, just one, you know, one wing. And then the other wing would be 80 cubits as well. You know, like he has two wings. And yeah. so the span of his wings was 80 cubits oh, just by himself. I got it. I got it. Yeah. And then, wow. <laughs> yeah. And then, and his face was like a lightning of fire and his eyes full of darkness, like sparks. And out of his nostrils came a stinking smoke and his mouth was as the gulf of a precipice and the one of his wings was four score cubits. Uh, and so, yeah, again, that's 80, you know, four score is 80. So yeah, uh, 80 cubits long for just one of his wings. I mean, that's a pretty big, you know, fallen angel. But when you start to look at some of those, um, mountains, you know, that resemble tree trunks, stumps that you get a different, you know, appreciation for what could have been, you know, height of a man. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then the the size of those trees. Uh, again, you know, um, for those that have not in uh, – Kathy, did you post a link to that video in the chat room? No, but I will. Okay, yeah, if you would do that so that people can go and look at it and watch it for themselves. And, and again, um, I'm not affirming this as truth. I'm just saying that the presentation that he brings forth and its connections – the structure of these mountains certainly seem to resemble tree stumps. Uh, and like even Devil's Tower, which everybody is a familiar, everybody's familiar with that. And the scientific explanation, as Kath Kathy talked about earlier, is that those mountains were created, um, you know, were created by volcanic activity and that the, it's a lava flow that hardened into a column and then whatever the other portion of the mountain, I guess all that just got washed away or whatever they say, you know, to explain how only the lava flow uh, is left as a column. But um, well, what I thought was the most interesting was considering it in um, connection with um, the earth being, null and void in a wasteland right. and i think i was reading that right at the time you know because i had just gotten your book mm -hmm. right at the time that i was watching this and so then you begin to think well what could have been occurring you know the uh, angel fallen angels or you know the the antediluvian a the world before the you know Hold on, Kathy. Or, okay oh okay i i you know, it was uh, your sound was breaking up, and so I thought that the the music was coming on, but it's not. It's not that. But um, speak again. Finish up what you were saying. Well, I just was connecting yeah. it to that time that uh, the Earth had right. become null and void in a wasteland. Yeah. You know, and so what was going on? Could there have been things going on that that we just haven't even considered before? Right. Yeah. And so for those that don't know what we're talking about, let me explain this just a little bit, because um, this is something that both David and uh, David Carrick and, uh, and I went into in great t detail last night when we were, excuse me, when we were talking about the, um, the earth in, in, when you read Genesis, it speaks about the earth becoming null and void. Uh, well, not null and void was without form and void. Right. And Sorry. Uh, oh yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, I used to actually, that was no. the way that uh, I'm an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> that was the way that I had said it before. And actually one of my listeners had, um, had written to me and, told me that, you know, there's a big difference between becoming null and void and actually becoming, you know, without form and void. And so I was uh, careful to, um, you know, to state it correctly, but just to read the passages really quick, because again, this does, in my opinion, um, ties together with a previous era, a previous age, 
a, a previously unknown Earth age, which also uh, ties together in with the mythology surrounding Atlantis, uh, exactly. the reason that we see all these megalithic sites all over the world and the you know like puma punku and the massive destruction that we see there and the kind of cataclysms that would have had to have taken place in order for those huge stones to have been shifted and moved and uh those megalithic sites destroyed in the manner that we see them today uh did you want to comment before i read this well it it answers the questions that so many have that they think only science or space or um aliens being our you know ancestors seeding us it answers those questions because those things exist as either lore or there's some you know his ancient history like atlantis and that can be reconciled with this information, if you right. look at it. Right, exactly. And then again, uh, one of the things that David and I talked about is that one of the reasons why there are so many people that are leaving the churches and going outside of you know, their congregations and mainstream Christianity in order to answer um, their the things that they're interested in wanting uh, and seeking answer to, like such as the ancient alien thing and uh, the mythologies of Atlantis and um, all of these pre-Adamic megalithic cities and sites is because they're not getting answer. You know, the, most pastors and preachers do not, you know, they believe in a young earth. Um, and because of that, it, you can see by the geological record, the archaeological record, the mythologies uh, of uh, the, even just the um, the longevity and the history of humanity, pre-Adamic humanity, that it far exceeds this 6,000-year timeline for what is only modern humanity, in my opinion, that it, the 6,000 years date back to Adam and Eve, but most certainly in the Genesis narrative, once you understand it, it affirms there being a much longer time span and a preceding earth age and era, uh, which nobody takes into account. And because this is ignored by all of these pastors and preachers and ministers, um, you know, they, they, it's, a uh, it's almost really laughable that they have to deny so much that is obvious, you know, within the, the creation uh, in order to fit everything into this um, this young, uh, small, just only six thousand year timeline, and so uh, once you understand this, what is called the gap theory, um, and again, I invite people to really listen to the show that David and I, I did because he, you know he's one of those that only comes from this perspective from the canonical text, whereas I've you know studied it from all different angles and perspectives and share all of that information. Uh, even in this new book, The Vaulted Dome of the Earth, and revisiting the Genesis narrative again to uh, break down the first four days of creation so that I can elaborate and emphasize what is being spoken about on the second day with the creation of the firmament and how all of that um, you know, connects to uh, the, uh, that the was crystalline really firmament. Yeah, I thought that was real important. You did that. I really liked it. I wanted to point out you're left with only as as possibility the Big Bang theory, or Young Earth, or the Gap theory. I mean, right. Or else the Big Bang and aliens. You know, right, right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I I I find it really unfortunate that modern Christianity just ignores for the most part, you know, the possibility of the gap theory with all that, you know, is there. If you only look at the meanings of the words, I mean, right. how they, exactly. they completely ignore formless wasteland. Yes. And un, un, in an indistinguishable ruin. 
So yeah. Satan has gotten the upper hand completely by overtaking it with science and education and and media. And the youth are, are being fed that as, as fact, and so that's what they believe, and they see it all around. Right, and that's why they are leaving the churches, because they're not getting answer. Nobody is helping them to understand what is obvious to you know to them, especially all these you know this new generation growing up with ancient aliens and that whole perspective that is being thrust upon the collective, uh, and so they're getting their answers from there, you know. And then the the whole thing uh, about the ancient aliens is uh, that whole the History Channel, even though they bring up and they show to us all these megalithic sites and um they are affirming that the ancient aliens are our creators and which right. is just an extension of the whole darwinian heliocentric exactly. worldview um and so when you again when you understand what is written and affirmed within the scriptures well it ties together the ancient mysteries and all of the oral traditions of the peoples of the world together with the biblical prophetic word um, because the bible no matter you know what you study as far as uh, the different mythologies the bible is the only one which is prophetic and contains you know even now one third of the prophecies that are written in the biblical narrative are for our day in our generation uh, for the written for the fig tree, the final generation, and because um, all of the other, not just you know fifty percent, but one hundred percent of all of the other prophecies which are laid out in Scripture have come to be proven true, and that you know um, uh, God's batting one hundred percent. It affirms it as absolutely, in my mind, as being divinely inspired. Yeah, yeah the aliens don't have that. <laughs> right. No, exactly. Um, you can't go to the Sumerian mythologies, the ancient Egyptian exactly. teachings, and find, you know, just thousands and thousands upon uh, thousands of prophecies and have them all uh, revealed as truth. Uh, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find you know, 10, 15, 20. Um, but to have thousands contained in, you know, one scriptural account, which has um, historically been affirmed as being uh, given to a prophet to be passed down to us and to our generation. I mean, the the whole story um, affirms itself and stands as a witness, confirming witness to the veracity of the Bible as being uh, the inerrant word of God, which makes it completely different from all the other texts. But anyway, uh, okay, great. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, Kathy is going to share with the chat room a few links to. Um, I also did a guest appearance with. Uh, now you see TV on the vaulted dome of the earth a couple nights ago. And, um, and again, I, I did the two shows with Rob Skiba on revolution radio, talking about this book as well, the vaulted dome of the earth. And so, um, in the first three chapters, because I do revisit the, the Genesis narrative in order to look at, what exactly happened in the first four days of creation, according to um, what is laid out in not only Genesis, but I also share the the Genesis timeline, the first four days of the creation week, from these other biblical texts as well, and break them down by each one of these days. Um, the Cave of Treasures, the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, um, the Complete Jewish Bible, the Targum, um, the Book of the Bee, Flavius Josephus, um, the Antiquities of the Jews, and um, and then the other one is the Chronicles of Jeremiah. 
And the reason I use all of these texts is because each one of them contain an account of the first seven days of the creation week. And they speak about, just like Genesis does, you know, the first day, the earth, um, the earth being, well, the formation of light and darkness and then the creation of the earth, or what is in Genesis the recreation, the reconstruction and the reconstitution of the reformation of the earth, uh, which I'll go into here in just a second. The second day is when the firmament is established, which divides the waters above from the waters below. Um, the earth, you know, on the first day is also inscribed upon the waters of the deep, uh, the firmament being established on the second day. And then on the third day, the dry land is pulled above what is sea level, uh, all the waters of the ocean. And because the waters of the below, they covered the face of the earth and it was just water. And then the land is pushed up above sea level. And that's also what creates the rivers, the streams, the creeks, and uh, all of the lakes, ponds, and uh, the pools of water form the oceans of the uh, of the world that um all of them are you know they are connected to sea level which the characteristic of water is to always pull in um in a horizontal plane uh to find its level that if you raise water above what is sea level that it will run its course and seek to come to you know other larger pools until finding containment it will you know then form a horizontal pool uh, a collected you know like a lake or uh, or an ocean or a sea uh, a pond um, a, some body of water, and then on the fourth day, you have the heavenly luminaries, the, including the two great stars or the two great lights, um, the sun and the moon, and the planets, all the wandering stars, and all the celestial luminaries being created on the fourth day, and then they're put into the firmament, which was fitted to and encapsulates the circle of the earth and so all of these heavenly luminaries are very much smaller according to the genesis narrative they are very much smaller than that of the earth and they hold circuit within the firmament that was fitted to the earth so the whole postulation that the sun is you know, 99.86% of the mass of the entire solar system and that all of these other planets are held by its gravitational attraction and that they move in circuit and circle and orbit around that of the sun. All of that is um, contrived. It's all, it's basically, it's an outright lie is what it is. But anyway, so revisiting I open with these two passages because um, it's important to understand that these first two verses of the Genesis account are very important for understanding that indeed what God is speaking about with the the creation, the heavens and the earth, uh, that he's not just speaking about 6,000 years, but that there is... A, a huge amount of time um, being relegated by and conveyed within the first two verses of Scripture, which it says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so, the, the second verse. First, you know, in the first verse, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, 
God created the heaven and the earth. It doesn't say that God created the heaven and the earth, uh, a destroyed earth. It says he created the heaven and the earth. And he creates, when he creates, he creates in perfection. He creates in beauty and harmony and establishes everything uh, and all the natural laws in harmony, in, in synchronicity, so that everything works in union and is beneficial to one another and that all things take care, you know, like the rains uh, create the food or, or water the plants and the plants and uh, they grow and they cultivate and feed, you know, all the animals and then the animals feed. And, I mean, everything contributes and takes care of one another. But the um, in the second verse, you have to realize and the earth was without form and void. It's very significant here because God wouldn't create the earth without form. When you look up the word without form, in the Hebrew, it's tohu va bohu. Um, was, the word was is haya, which means was, is, or become, or became. And so, and the earth is was, became, or becomes without form. And without form is deserted wasteland. And then, and void, when you look up the word void, bohu, that word essentially means indistinguishable ruin. And so in the first, let me pull that up to you really quick. In the first chapter um, of my book, I named the chapter. Um, the first, the name of the first chapter of my book is, "And the primeval earth was a formless wasteland and undistinguishable ruin," which is essentially when you use the Strong's Concordance, that's what that particular passage means, and so. The question is, how did the earth become a formless wasteland, a wasteland and undistinguishable ruin? And so you have to consider what was it that led to the earth becoming such as that? And so in my opinion, this is pointing to something that happened previous to the earth being recreated as is laid out in Genesis Chapter 1, pre following uh, verse 2 to 31 in Genesis chapter 1. And it's my opinion, and I lay this out, the, this argument and this postulation in chapter 2 of my book, The War in Heaven and Antediluvian Age. And I describe how it was that the rebel angels and Lucifer wanting to exalt himself above the stars of God, above the clouds of God, uh, to be like the Most High, to, to exalt his throne above the Mount of Congregation in the sides of the north, that it was his wanting to do that which led to what all of us, many of us, have heard about with the war in heaven, and that the war in heaven preceded what, the earth becoming a formless wasteland and that yeah please well there's a a paragraph in your book here and i think it's really uh, when you compare it to what science wants us to believe i think this is really excellent you say that um it's not in any way randomly selected or trivially placed or insignificantly composed how god was creating the world so i I just thought that that was really good right yeah with the yeah, because, because that's what, exactly what science wants. It's random right, and weird exactly. and significant. Right. And uh, yeah, the what Kathy is talking about is uh, I'm talking about the words that the Most High chose. Because you have to remember that Genesis, the first five books, the Torah, the Pentateuch, were dictated to Moses. And so every word is significant. And it's not random. It's not meaningless. Everything was perfectly chosen, selected to uh, describe exactly what had happened 
in the earlier creation. And so, again, when you use the Strong's to decipher the context of the Hebrew that is used to relay um, the early creation account, this is the story that is told. And again, the when you understand uh, how the war in heaven ties into all of this, I also lay out that this is why um, the firmament was established, that it's my opinion the firmament was put into place in order to imprison the fallen angels, the rebel angels, and to keep them from being able to escape the judgment that is coming. And uh, again, David and I, we did a, a really, uh, it was a three-hour show um, okay. on on this particular topic. And we covered a, a lot of really important information, which, you know, um, uh, is contained in this particular book in the first three chapters. And then uh, chapter three, I described, remember from whence thou art fallen. Um, because those of you that are familiar with my work, you know that I speak about our pre-existence and how that we were once um, spiritual beings, uh, also part of the Council of the Mighty, that our spirits, uh, even Adam, you know, in the creation of Adam, it talks about his body being created of the dust and then his breath of life being blown into that flesh form. And so that shows the marriage of the spirit, which is his pre-existent spirit, with that of our flesh body form. And the same thing applies to all of us. And so our spirits are immortal, and they pre-existed with the Father and the Son previous to our incarnation into flesh form, which is also what is um, referenced in Jeremiah chapter 1 where the word of the Lord goes to Jeremiah and tells him, I knew you before you ever entered into the womb of your mother. I had foreordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. The same kind of thing. Uh, and for those that are interested in knowing more about preexistence and predestination, my seventh book, Skyfall, Angels of Destiny, is all about this topic and about this subject matter. And again, I use like 200 uh, source references from many uh, canonical as well as extra biblical texts to uh, to prove uh, that particular point. But anyways, these first three chapters then lay out what I go into in the fourth chapter of this new book, which is laying out the first four days of creation according to all of those biblical and extra biblical texts. Um, and then in the the fifth chapter, I take in the some of the specifics, the quotations, and some of the the specific passages that I wanted to comment upon, and highlight them in that particular chapter. And then in chapter six, I use bring forth many um, canonical passages, verses, and chapters to affirm what is being told in um, all of this, you know, Genesis timeline and, uh, and narrative. And it, it's quite a lengthy read because, again, it gives you a perspective on these first four days of creation uh, from many different angles. It's like having eight different witnesses that all tell you a little bit different story on exactly what happened. Um, which I, I thought it was fascinating, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, and so, I, and I think it's greatly beneficial, you know, to study it with, from that many different angles and that many different perspectives. And then to revisit the canonical text, all the different, you know, passages from like Psalms and Job and uh, all of those that um, talk about. Uh, the the same thing, and then I specifically over the next few chapters um, focus on certain passages of the uh, the the biblical text, like Job um, speaking about the molten looking glass. Um, I break down 
you know, the firmament and the word rakia when you investigate what that actually means and show from the biblical commentaries and the multiple biblical translations how all of them are inferencing that um, that the firmament is a solid structure. It's not just an expanse, as Doug Hamp, you know, wants us to believe, but that there is absolutely a firm, sturdy, crystalline nature to the structure, um, which I'll share a passage, and then I'll get you to comment on that, um, Kathy. From Flavius Josephus, he says this, After this, on the second day, he placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament round it and put it together in a manner agreeable to the earth and fitted it for giving moisture and rain and for affording the advantage of the dews. And so here again, the firmament being a crystalline structure, uh, being fitted to the earth. Um, I mean, it's the same thing that is described in Genesis chapter 2 when you really study it and realize that the, you know, the, uh, the firmament is the vaulted dome of the earth. I think the uh, mechanics of it, you know, when you talk about the um, firmament, and the dew and in the way it's fitted together if you understand what the the model of the earth is in this in this way biblically you know outlined it just makes a lot more sense to me i mean i i can see this the the concept of space and the fact that we're the way they have told us that we're moving uh, the earth is moving and we're moving in concert with the sun and the soul, the, well, the solar system and the universe and Milky Way and the universe. It doesn't make any sense. And, and a question often comes up about um, meteors, meteorites, you know, at the, the ones like the Perseid meteor shower, how that comes every year. I don't see how that possibly could work. If the mechanics of the solar system in the heliocentric model are such as they say, but yet I think you've talked about this that um, it could be uh, something that is designed by the Most High, right? And part of um, because another thing that I talk about and cover in great detail in this particular uh, book is that the the firmament is established in seven layers. And uh, this actually brings me to another question that I wanted to, to, to answer. Um, people had asked whether the firmament moves in one of the commentaries in the video. And no, the, the firmament itself is a solid structure. But it does speak about in the, like the Sefer Yitzhara and the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, they describe the lower you know, from the atmosphere and what we call outer space, that the lower two levels of the expanse from the plane of the earth up to what is the the firmament as ceiling of the vaulted dome of the earth, uh, that that is broken up into seven levels. And those seven levels have the um, the planets, what are called the planets of the universe, which include Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, and Venus, and the sun and the moon. Those are the seven planets of the universe, according to uh, the book of Enoch, the second book of Enoch, and the Sefer Yitzhara, and uh, the legends of the Jews as laid out by Ginsberg. All of them speak about these seven different levels to the heavens, and that it's these levels which spin and move and that the stars are um are contained and even the the book the second book of enoch speaks about a lesser moon which is something that i elaborated upon in great detail as well mm -hmm. in those shows and um and they all move in circle around polaris that polaris is the only fixed star of the sky dome 
of the celestial night. And it shows to us where the Most High has established his throne and the heavenly temple, that that is the center of the vaulted dome, and that right above there is where the the throne of the Most High God is established. But everything else, all these other seven circles, they move in revolution around Polaris, and they hold in containment all of the orbits of all of the stars, and which is exactly what is depicted in the time lapse photography. Star uh, trails. Yeah, of the star trails. And yeah. so yeah, and so all of that in my opinion, the time lapse photography also affirms uh verifies exactly what we're speaking about with the movements of the the different stars and it's it's my opinion that you know because the meteor showers like the perseid meteor showers and others are um fixed that they come uh, at certain times of the year that they are also a portion to these uh these seven layers of the heavenly circle and that um that they have interplay with the sun and that's why we see them as shooting stars in the time that we are able to witness them uh as the phenomena which you know occurring of the the different meteor meteor showers and um all of that which are absolutely beautiful for those that have never been able to watch or see one you know what i really like is that we're getting beyond at least within some circles beyond explaining and uh trying to prove that uh, the earth is actually flat <laughs> and and not, and not moving and going beyond and exploring you know what what you've written about and um how it all is possibility that is awesome to me. I would love to have you talk about because I think um, that also comes in well here. Aurora Borealis and um, what was it? The fiery what was that? Oh yeah, the um, the sea of glass likened to crystal mingled with fire. Yes, and how that would be the aurora borealis. And didn't you say there there are only certain times of year of the year that that. I think that that's where I was connecting that, that it was right. red like that. Yeah, that, um, yeah, and, and for those that don't know what we're talking about, there's a passage, and I'll actually, um, and I wondered I too, I could, here. I didn't look this up, but I remembered Flatwater had done a few videos about the Aurora Borealis and some sword. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, I do. He was talking about that as, uh, as being the flaming, the cherubim, the put into place to be the flaming, you know, the sword to yeah. prevent the... Um, you were talking about the cherubim and how they were right at one level um, at the at the crystalline barrier. I don't know all the terms. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, I, no, it's fine. The cherubim with their their wings touching. I mean, the the picture was just amazing to con, you know try and conceive of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, that's also all of this that we're talking about is uh, in a chapter in this new book, which is based on the um, the throne of God uh, in connection with the firmament. Because one of the things that I learned in doing this research and doing this study is that you cannot separate the throne of God from that of the firmament. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, also, I want to really quick address a, another question. Um, that people that are concerned with um, celebrating the feasts of the Most High God, uh, as laid out in Leviticus, that um, the Feast of Trumpets, which always occurs on the first of Tishri, that that will not happen until October 3rd. And so you don't have to worry about having missed it. And then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that will occur on the 12th of October. 
And the reason it's off this year is because um, by a month is because this year they added the Hebrew calendar added a 13th month in order to, to, um, well, I guess I should explain this too. The God's calendar is a, a based on the lunar months, which alternate 29 and 30 days. And so that's only 354 days. And so every three years or so, depending on when the barley harvest is uh, and the celebration of Passover, because you have to have the barley ripe in order to celebrate the the feast of first fruits and the day of first fruits which is the third spring celebration uh the the third spring feast uh, of, of the seven uh, holy holy days of the most high god and so unless the barley is ripe you can't celebrate passover and then you know the feast of unleavened bread which those always ha- happen on the um, the 14th of Nisan, the 15th of Nisan is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the 16th of Nisan is the uh, the Day of First Fruits and the seven day feast or festival of First Fruits, which is when the barley um, is waved by the Most High Priest as uh, atonement um, for uh, the sins of, of, of Israel in asking for forgiveness. So you didn't miss it. Um, and if you want to celebrate the, the feast of the most high God in the way as laid out in Leviticus, then all you have to do is honor the feast of tabernacles on the 3rd of October. Um, because again, um, there's nine years or, or, or seven years out of 19 where they have to add this additional month, uh, an additional 30-day month at the end. And so there will be 13 lunar months in order to restore order with the solar calendar, the Enochian solar calendar. And this happened to be one of those years. And so um, when they do that, there's the because the last month, the 12th month, is called Adar, uh, that's the Hebrew name for the twelfth month. Instead of December, it's called Adar. A D A R. Well, when they add a thirteenth month, that month is called Adar two. And so, those of you that um, have ordered or have my Hebrew calendar, my um, Enochian Hebrew calendar, where I convert the Gregorian solar calendar to um, the lunar calendar as laid out by God's, you know, the the creator's calendar, this is why the first month is, uh, begins with Adar 2. And so that realigns all of the next 12 months uh, according to um, the barley harvest as because it's always that that determines when the month of Nisan actually occurs. And so, um, so it's the first of Tishri and it's Rosh Hashanah, right? Yeah, the piece, first piece of, of Tishri. Okay. Yes, which even though this is the the Jewish New Year, uh, really that was all changed in Exodus, as I showed in that that one show where I showed how God had re uh, basically given to Moses and the Israelites when He led them out uh, um, during the Exodus. He reinstituted this um, this lunar calendar, and he explained it to them by, you know, Passover uh, and the unleavened bread was always on the fifteenth, and the fifteenth is always a Sabbath, and that the um, the lunar Sabbaths always fall in a line with the phases of the moon. The first day and the first Sabbath is always. Uh, what is referenced as Kadesh, which is the uh, waxing crescent moon, the first uh, appearance of the waxing crescent moon. And then the next Sabbath, which is always on the eighth day of the lunar month, that occurs on the first quarter phase of the moon. Um, The 15th 
which is always when you celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and also the um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the Spring Feast, um, that all of those always fall on Sabbath. And the then the 20, and that always aligns with the full moon, which is why um, God, Yahweh Elohim, led the Hebrews out on the 15th that, that night after Sabbath, which is Sabbath is only during the daytime from dawn to dusk. And then at night, that in Sabbath and that he led them out of Egypt during the full moon on the 15th, uh, which is again, um, the, the third Sabbath is always aligned with the full moon. And then the fourth Sabbath is aligned with the third quarter moon. And, uh, that falls on the 22nd. And then the 29th is the fifth Sabbath. And that's always, um, aligns with the lunar conjunction. And so anyways, this this year, the first of Tishri will fall on the 3rd of October, and that will be the Feast of Trumpets. And then on the 10th of Tishri, which is the Day of Atonement, that is Yom Kippur. That will be on the 12th. And then you have Sukkot, uh, or the Feast of Tabernacles, which always falls on the 15th of Tishri. That will fall this year on the 17th of October. And so those of you that are wanting to keep the feast, uh, those are the days that you have to celebrate them. All right. Um, continuing. What was I talking about? <laughs> At uh, the throne of God. Oh, yes. yeah. Okay. Yes. The you, are, in the- you are correct. Okay. Let me go back to that and let me explain this. Um, from Revelation 4, John, in talking about uh, the Most High being seated on the throne, he describes it as this. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. Skipping down just a little bit, it says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four bees full of eyes before and behind. Now, he also speaks, John also speaks about this same thing in Revelation 15, but it's a little bit different this time, which is interesting. He says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And so when you study uh, these different visions, the prophets that share these different visions of God seated on his throne, you will, like in Moses, he describes in Exodus 24, uh, God seated um, on his throne and that the throne is on a paved work of sapphire. You know, Zen, can I say, sure. I was always taught, always taught that Sea of Glass meant um, the saints. Always taught that. I mean, what a difference. Oh, yeah, a huge difference. Yeah, and um, I've, uh, you know, also heard It doesn't that, make any sense, though, yeah, either. it doesn't, not at all. And I, I've also heard that, you know, Sea of Glass was just a, a still, you know, still water. Um, but, again, when you study the firmament, you see always a representation of the firmament as either a paved work of sapphire or a sea of glass like into crystal. Or, you know, in Ezekiel, it specifically mentions the firmament as being above the heads of the cherubim. I mean, all these references are to the firmament as the vaulted dome of the earth once you have this understanding. Um, and so let me explain this as with the connection to the Aura Borealis, uh, because again, for those that have heard um, my explanation of this, 
the vaulted dome, as I said, the Polaris is exactly where the center of the vaulted dome is located. And it's right above Polaris that the Most High has established his throne and the heavenly temple. Well, because all, you know, when you have a, a dome, all of the sides of the dome coming up from uh, all of the round, they all meet in center. And that center is called the north, uh, the sides of the north, as referenced by Lucifer in Isaiah 14. And so no matter if it's south, west, or east, all of these directions come together in the north, at the very center of the vaulted dome. All of these walls of the firmament come together in arching apex until they meet where Polaris is, right above um, what would be the North Pole on the circle of the Earth, because the North Pole is in the very center of the Earth plane, and it's right above the North Pole that the that Polaris has been fixed and situated as the center of the vaulted dome. And so uh, it's my opinion that what because we see only occasion, um, sometimes description of, like in this case, the sea of glass mingled with fire, and that what John is witness to and what he is seeing in this particular vision is the vaulted dome when the aurora borealis is present. And it's only above the North Pole and these northern, extreme northern latitudes um, near what would be, you know, the center of the Earth plane that this phenomena even exists. And so it's my opinion that that affirms, if indeed this is what uh, John was seeing when he describes the firmament as being uh, mingled with fire, that that affirms that you know the most high god indeed having established his throne that this is what represents the sides of the north because again this phenomena the aurora borealis only happens in these extreme uh northern latitudes uh, above what would be you know the um the north pole as the center of the earth plane and so that's why i see connection and that, um, you know, with this, the sea of glass being mingled with fire, that that is actually a reference to the Aurora Borealis. And in my book, um, it, especially in the PDF copy, because all of those um, have colored pictures in the electronic copy. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So you can actually see the color and the resolution and uh, the the beauty of the aurora borealis and how it does look like fire um i'll i'll send you that too kathy you're wonderful you um had this text um the ladder of jacob and it, yes. it and a uh, part here says lord god of adam your creature and lord god of abraham and isaac my fathers and of all who have walked before you in justice you who sit firmly on the cherubim and the fiery throne of glory, and the many-eyed ones, just as I saw in my dream, holding the four-faced cherubim, bearing also the many-eyed seraphim, carrying the whole world under your arm. That's just a part of it, but that's really cool. Yeah, that's a beautiful text too, and it's a, it's a, it's a one of those lost books that most people have never read or heard about. And so that's why I decided to include it in its entirety in this book, uh, because I it will bless people's lives to to read it. And then also, it's prophetic. You know, it speaks about Yeshua uh, in his coming and how he would be Savior Messiah and how he would see um, save Adam, Jacob, and uh, Abraham's seed. Um, being, you know, because there is that distinction. I know a lot of people still don't understand that the, that the devil has his own physical bloodline, uh, that the, the sons of Cain, the sons of Ishmael, the sons of Esau, that they are all part of this progeny that is excluded 
from the seed of promise, which are the the children of Adam, the children of Isaac, the children of Abraham. Uh, and so there very literally is a differentiation of peoples here on the earth that we're not just all one and the same, that there is a, uh, there is a group, um, a, a whole different bloodline dedicated, and, and they worship Lucifer uh, as their god. And they do not care about the common good or the goodwill of humanity that they are working from behind the scenes in order to establish world government and global dominance, you know, global meaning uh, the new world order and the whole heliocentric worldview. Um, But all of that, in, in understanding that, it helps one to understand even the parable of the sower, the parable of the kingdom, the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, the distinction, the separation of the goat and the sheep. I mean, everywhere you see this uh, differentiation and this distinction playing out. Um, David and Goliath, Yeshua and the Pharisees, why he called them of their father the devil. uh, And he called them a den of vipers. I mean, they very literally are the children of the Nakash, the feathered serpent of Genesis chapter 3. Um, I think you need to do another show <laughs> that is just <laughs> focused on uh, the different um, levels of heaven and how the patriarchs ascended up through the levels of he- heaven. And well, you know, they need to buy the book, but <laughs> but the, but I mean that I think is is the most precious part. I love this book, but, but that uh, you know visualizing and and seeing what we never really spend any time thinking about but with the understanding of of the the shape of the biblical flat earth and then connecting the firmament and and how that design would be and the throne of god above and the heavens ascending you know through to that level that's the most amazing part to me that's just Astounding. You know, the only difficult thing is that two hours would not be enough to even cover one of those texts, you know, as far as the book. Because yeah. um, in, in what Kathy is talking about is I share a particular chapter um, called the Ten Heavens where I break down um, the various levels of heaven according to the vision of Paul in the Apocalypse of Paul and Enoch in the Book of the Secrets of Enoch and Isaiah in the Ascension of Isaiah because those three accounts give greater detail on these various levels of heaven more so than any others except the vision of Paul. But that one in itself is so long that I I couldn't include it because I was already you know, 456 pages into it. Uh, What I liked about that was how you took individual texts uh, and and you were able to align them that it was like one story coming across. That was just, I I had to stop and, and remind myself, no, he's got a different text here, but it all came together as just one ascension, you know, the, all the different, patriarchs who were involved in and how they went through it was just amazing it's really great and uh like the whole you know genesis narrative on the uh the first four days of creation in in sharing the story like that it gives you greater detail on each one of the levels of heaven and what's located there and how they're connected to like, for instance, the third heaven is connected to paradise. Um, the fourth heaven, the uh, the circuits of the sun and the moon and the other heavens to um, the other celestial luminaries. And uh, the uh, and at the very height at the what is referenced sometime as the the third heaven or the seventh heaven or the tenth heaven, uh, that at the height of the heights, is where the throne of God and the presence of the Most High is. And 
and and when you understand that um they are basically all describing the same thing and giving just different accounts and different uh, detail to the entire story you understand how they come together to formulate in 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 unified form the same concept and that in my mind helps one to understand uh exactly what is laid out as far as the enclosed world system with you know the first um the first heaven the second heaven the lower atmosphere and what we call outer space and then the firmament covering that and then the place of god and paradise being above the vaulted dome of the earth and and that the you know the presence of god and the holy angels is separated from that of the world of man uh and also of the lower angels because they're not allowed into the upper heavens either oh i've been informed that i have to i uh, wish you happy birthday from everyone they asked me to sing i said no <laughs> <laughs> well tell everybody thank you and that i greatly appreciate everyone and um uh, and that uh you know i really feel uh, a family vibe from all those that um fellowship with us and that share and uh give us encouragement and that you know um that just share their kindness with us in all the different ways that they do and um it's a it's a beautiful blessing to know that we're not alone in this journey alone in this walk in this um, this struggle for truth and, and revelation and that, you know, that there are others that are interested in wanting to hear and learn and, and you know, and to also walk with us in this journey and to grow together. It's a, it's a really beautiful thing. I, I agree. Um, I don't think, I think I feel more connected to the body of Christ this way with our virtual community through radio shows, through communicating through email and our Facebook page, than you know, I ever did in a church environment, you know, and I, I I have people tell me, you need to go out and fellowship and be with people, you know, and I know in that environment, I'm just going to be staring, you know, at somebody not communicating and we communicate much more <laughs> this way right. and it's about things that are deep and things of god so i i encourage people if if they feel disconnected to you know get in touch with me perilandra7 com, and i can tell you how to connect more with us so that's um you're cracking up a little bit but yes this is um uh... This is church, you know, for me, fellowshipping with others in this way. And you're right. We can talk about very deep things here, more so than, you know, what others are able to discuss that, you know, when they go and ask their pastors and preachers about uh, these very deep aspects of the word, they don't get answer. Uh, and, And they'll tell them to well, not to worry about that kind of thing or to yeah. just ignore that kind of thing or um, that's, you know, we're not meant to understand that or or whatever. When in truth, um, God's word does contain those very deep secrets. And he wants us to dig and to understand and to come to revelation upon them uh, that we just have to uh, seek and uh, prove our, you know, show ourselves approved in such way. Amen. I agree. Uh, I just want to, you know, thank everybody for all of your, you know, the birthday wishes and just for supporting our work and for listening to our shows and for all the encouragement and for, you know, sharing with us in the way that you do. We appreciate and love all of you. Thanks all. God bless thank all. Thank you. Bye. God bless. Good night, Kath. Talk Good night. to you soon. All right. Be blessed all.